Several young officers encouraged the lieutenant. They grew very excited and talked of annihilating the Americans. They came up to the command post and said they were ready to move out to start the attack immediately, but the camp commander intervened. The troops were exhausted, he announced. Much as he would like to help, he could not send these men into battle this day. They had been marching for two and three days. They had suffered through nerve-wracking crossings from Colón Bangara, and they had fought their way down to the plantation from Bairoko. They would soon enough be annihilating the enemy in the major attack in the south, and they must have at least a little rest. The young lieutenant from the 229th Regiment was so distraught that he undertook to argue with his superiors. Usually such action would mean immediate discipline, even to the point of death, but in this case the senior officers were sympathetic. The young lieutenant had obviously been through much, his uniform was stained and torn, and he had none of his equipment except his pistol and his samurai sword. But on the matter of rushing off to save a detachment of the 229th, the senior officers were adamant. The men could not go, not yet, and the lieutenant took one last despairing look around, and then he slipped away through the cocoa palms of the plantation into the gloom of the jungle. When General Sasaki learned of the plight of the 229th Command Post, he ordered the 1st Battalion of the 13th Regiment to relieve Colonel Hirada and then return to the plantation to participate in the general attack. The 1st Battalion of the 13th stepped out, but what happened next is not known. The records of the 229th Regiment were destroyed with the Munda base there on New Georgia. It is not even known where the fighting was occurring at that moment, but it must have been in Colonel Liversedge's area, for on that day he claimed to have killed many Japanese, and General Hester's forces were making no such progress. Early on the morning of July 11, Colonel Liversedge's troops at Enogai began to advance again. By eight o'clock that morning they had wiped out the small Japanese pockets, then they set about tidying up the Enogai camp as an American installation. At that point, Colonel Liversedge added up the results of his campaign so far. His marines and soldiers had killed 350 Japanese. They had lost 47 men killed, 80 wounded and 4 missing, and they had captured four big 140mm field guns, three anti-aircraft guns and 18 machine guns, rifles, grenade launchers, two diesel tractors and a searchlight. At Rabul, Admiral Kusaka had the word of the loss of his Enagai base within a matter of minutes after the last troops moved out. The 11th Air Fleet sent an air mission against Enagai almost immediately on its capture. At 10 o'clock that morning, Enagai was bombed, and again at 11.30am the Japanese came over. They did a little damage, knocked out some equipment, and killed three marines and wounded 15. Liversedge had been worrying about his wounded, whose condition was not improving any in the field, and so it was a great relief when three PBY seaplanes landed at three o'clock in the afternoon to take the wounded back to Guadalcanal. But the PBYs had scarcely landed than they were bombed and strafed by two Japanese floatplanes from the Shortlands base. Fortunately, the small arms fire from the shore drove the Japanese planes off without any damage, and the PBYs took off late that afternoon with all the wounded. That night, at nine o'clock, Seven Higgins boats filled with supplies came up from Rice Anchorage. Inogai then was secure and supplied, and now Colonel Liversedge could turn all his thoughts to moving on against Munda. Back in the Zanana area, General Hester was still bogged down, and Japanese snipers were holding up his advance with remarkable skill. In order to shorten the supply, Route General Hester decided to send the 172nd Regimental Combat Team to take Liana on the southeastern tip of the Munda Peninsula, very close to the defence perimeter of the Munda airfield garrison. General Sasaki moved his units around and soon had the Zanana Liana Trail cut off as completely as was the Munda Trail. In desperation, General Hester asked for naval artillery support and Admiral Turner sent him a task force to bombard the enemy. But General Hester was not used to working with naval gunfire support and he was afraid that the bombardment would hit among his own troops. Thus, his designated targets were so far from his own lines that the naval bombardment force sent up under Admiral Merrill could do him little good. The Japanese simply moved forward close to the American lines, and the shells passed over their heads. Merrill brought four cruisers and ten destroyers.
and they made a magnificent racket for 40 minutes. They fired 8,605 and 6-inch shells, which was enough to stun a regiment, and they then turned and went away. The result was a lot of chopped-up jungle, but no Japanese casualties. The most serious effect of the bombardment on the Japanese was to keep them up late, but the same had to be said for the Americans of the 172nd Regimental Combat Team. On the morning of July 12, General Hester's men got moving again on the trail to Liana, but the Japanese harried them all day long. Then before dark the enemy also cut the trail behind the Americans, taking them out of contact with the 169th Infantry altogether. The move left the 172nd deep in the jungle without food or water, and with a quarter of a mile of muddy swamp between them and their objective, Liana Beach. On July 12, Colonel Liversedge moved his forward headquarters to block the trail that led from Bairocco, the landing point of Japanese troops ferried over to New Georgia from Kolombangara. He had now accomplished his primary missions. Unfortunately, he was unaware of the two lesser trails that led from Bairocco Harbour to join up with the Munda Bairocco Trail below his block but there was nothing more he could do at the moment. Enemy patrols were active around Inogai that day, probing for weakness. One patrol was driven off and two Japanese were killed. The next assault had to be on Munda, and Colonel Liversedge did not have the force to undertake such a mission. He had to wait for reinforcements. General Hester's force was to be just that, but those troops had not arrived, and it did not look as though they would in the near future. Meanwhile, the Japanese were doing very well with their limited resources, and they had managed to continue to resupply their troops, using the trails unknown to the Americans. They began building up defences on the eastern shore of Bairocco Harbour, in preparation for the big assault. On July 13, Colonel Tomonari joined up at the plantation camp. More of his troops had been brought across Kolombangara Island after they had been landed on the wrong side during the big naval battle of Kula Gulf. The troops had ferried across the strait to Bairocco and followed the path carved out by the advance troops. General Sasaki was getting ready to move. Finally, the Japanese command back at Rabaul was taking the problem of New Georgia seriously. Early on the morning of July 12, a large force set sail from Rabaul for Kolombangara. It was led by Rear Admiral Shunji Izakin, the cruiser Jinsu, with some destroyers of Destroyer Squadron 2 Yukikaze, Hamakaze, Yugure and Kiyonami. They were escorting the destroyer transports Matsukaze, Satsuki, Minazuki and Yunagi, which were carrying the 1,300 troops of the 13th Regiment destined for the New Georgia battle. The Allies' coast watchers saw the Japanese ships moving and sent the word post-haste to Admiral Halsey, who ordered Admiral Ainsworth to go up the slot that night and intercept the enemy force. For this mission, Halsey gave Ainsworth additional destroyers so that he left Guadalcanal with ten, plus the cruisers Honolulu, Leander of the Royal New Zealand Navy and St. Louis. The Americans moved toward Kolombangara with the confidence of radar-equipped fighters. The Japanese moved south with the confidence of experienced night fighters, but the Americans had the advantage of night fighters of another sort in the air. Just after midnight, one of the Black Cats announced the approach from the north of a cruiser and five destroyers about 25 miles away. This was Admiral Izaki's escort force, and the Americans intended to attack by radar, fully expecting to be able to do so before the Japanese discovered them. However, the Japanese had already discovered the Americans as Admiral Ainsworth's ships swung into a single battle column, with five destroyers ahead and five destroyers behind the three cruisers. No, the Japanese did not have high-quality radar, but they did have electronic equipment to detect radar and to plot its emanations. Thus, Admiral Izaki knew the position and movements of the Americans for two hours before they arrived. At one o'clock on the morning of July 13, the American radar picked up the Japanese flotilla, one big blip and five little ones. Admiral Ainsworth ordered the ships to speed up while turning to the right to put the Japanese ships on the starboard beam. Thus, all the American warships would have a crack at the enemy. One of the problems of the Kula Gulf engagement had been the failure of the destroyers to use their torpedoes. That would not be the case this time. Just before 1.10pm, Admiral Ainsworth ordered the destroyers to start firing torpedoes at the blips on the radar.
At the moment that the American ships became visible in the moonlight, at about eight minutes past one in the morning, Admiral Izaki ordered the destroyers to begin firing torpedoes. They did, and the long lances were on their way toward the American column. Secure in his radar, Admiral Ainsworth came on for another few moments, then unleashed the six-inch guns of the cruisers. As usual, all three American cruisers began firing on the biggest blip on the radar screens, the light cruiser Jinsu. In less than ten minutes, they fired 2,600 shells at her. Perhaps twenty of them struck home, and they did the job. The Jinsu lost her steering, and then her fire rooms were hit and flooded, and she went dead in the water. At about this point, she was struck by two of the American torpedoes, and she broke in half. The two halves of the ship drifted apart, both burning. She had been able only to fire a few salvos at the Allied ships before she sank, taking down the Admiral and nearly all the crew of 480 men. One of those salvos had been aimed at the New Zealand cruiser Leander, and one shell at least hit her, knocking out her radio aerial. That was not very serious damage to accept for the sinking of an enemy cruiser, but Admiral Ainsworth had underestimated his enemy – those early torpedoes came on. The Admiral belatedly ordered a turn to the south, in making the turn the Leander caught a torpedo, which put her out of the battle. So Admiral Ainsworth detached the destroyers Radford and Jenkins to stand by the Leander and protect her from further attack, and at this point the Japanese cruiser Jinsu was sinking. Four of the support force destroyers turned immediately after firing their torpedoes and retreated for a reload. The Mikazuki stood by the stricken flagship for a few minutes, then saw her danger and the impossibility of being much help to those two flaming pyres that had so recently been joined in one ship. She too turned and scudded north to reload. Above the battle, the pilot of a black cat night fighter watched and reported to Admiral Ainsworth that the Japanese were retreating north at high speed. If that was not quite the case, still Admiral Ainsworth had to believe what the pilot saw. He also believed the reports from his ships, which claimed to have hit six separate vessels and left them all burning. As the night wore on, he began to revise these figures downward, but he was still of the opinion that the battle was over, and all that remained to be done was to mop up. The destroyers Nicholas, O'Bannon and Taylor were sent off northward, told to chase the enemy as far as the shortlands if necessary, and sink them if they could. But they did not get the whole message, and although they moved out, they soon turned and headed back down the slot. In the belief that Admiral Ainsworth had retired for the night, they were out of the battle. The enemy, in fact, was not retreating toward the shortlands. Rather, Captain Yoshima Shimai had led the ships into a squall not far to the north, where they slowed and completed their torpedo reload in just a little over fifteen minutes. Then they turned and came down at high speed to seek out the Americans again. Meanwhile, the four troop-carrying destroyers had moved in close to the Columbangara coast, turned around the island, and were now discharging the 1,300 troops of the 13th Regiment at Sandfly Harbour on the far coast. Although Admiral Izaki had gone down with his ship, his mission was already a success. Now Captain Shimai set out to make it more so. There were no blips on the American radar, but Admiral Ainsworth had those reports of burning enemy ships, and he turned north again to find them. Just before two o'clock in the morning, the radar of the flagship Honolulu picked up blips a little over twelve miles away. What ships were these? Were they the destroyers he had sent north? And were they the enemy? There seemed to be only one way to find out. Ainsworth began calling up all his destroyers to discover their whereabouts. Meanwhile, Captain Shimai was moving his destroyers south at high speed, prepared to attack as soon as he could make out the enemy. Five minutes later, Captain Shimai saw the American force and ordered the torpedo attack. Earlier that night, the American fleet had turned sharply to the right to begin firing. The captain guessed that they would do so again, and ordered the torpedoes sent a little off to the right of the oncoming line of vessels. The Japanese destroyers fired their torpedoes, swung around and raced away. Just at this point Admiral Ainsworth had completed his roll call and decided that the ships on the radar screen had to be the enemy. He ordered the cruisers to open fire and once again to make a sharp right turn to be sure they all had good firing position. The sharp right turn took the American force squarely across the tracks of the Japanese torpedoes 
A lookout aboard the Honolulu saw the first one pass by and shouted out the word. But by that time, another torpedo had smashed into the St. Louis, and the Honolulu took the third in the bow, then a dud in the stern. The stem torpedo made a hole, but the bow torpedo spread the Honolulu's forepart out like a shark's mouth. As the damage control parties ran to their work, the bridge of the Honolulu was exposed to a dreadful sight. Another torpedo smashed into the destroyer Gwyn, just ahead of the Honolulu. With a roar and a blinding flash, the Gwyn blew up in the middle. The crew tried to save her, but there was no saving this night. As dawn began to appear, the destroyer Ralph Talbot stood by to take off survivors, all but two officers and fifty-nine men, and in the bright morning light she was scuttled. Admiral Ainsworth retired to the base at Tulagi. He had sent ahead the word that he had scored an enormous victory, which had been true before he went back into the fight to go after the Japanese destroyers. By the time he got to Tulagi, he was thoroughly depressed by the extent of his losses and damages, but at the base the cruiser men were greeted as conquerors by a brass band and all sorts of congratulations. Ainsworth's self-esteem was also raised when the Americans rescued one of the handful of survivors of the Jintsu, and he swore up and down that the Americans had sunk most of the Izaki force. It was not true, of course, but in a way the Americans had scored a victory even in defeat. They could afford to have three cruisers damaged, one so badly that it was out of the rest of the war. They could even afford to lose a destroyer. The American production machine at home could absorb this easily enough, and for every ship sunk, three came along. There was no brass band to greet Captain Shimai when he returned to Rabul, and there was not even much talk of victory, that was not the Japanese way. But the feeling that a victory had been won ran high, and the Japanese too exaggerated the extent of the American losses, claiming all three cruisers sunk plus several, not one, destroyers. The press at home in Japan trumpeted as usual, and within the Japanese naval establishment, the memory of Admiral Izaki was criticised because he repeated a mistake that, the Japanese believed, had already cost the Japanese the battleship Haiei. At the start of the battle, to confuse the enemy, he had turned on his searchlight. But instead of confusing the Americans, the searchlight, said his detractors, had given them an aiming point that claim was not really true. The Americans were firing by radar and not by visual observation. The Japanese criticism of their commander showed a basic misunderstanding and underestimation of the enemy's capability, just as the continued American carelessness about Japanese torpedoes showed an American failure. Writing shortly after the war, Samuel Elliot Morrison expressed wonder that the American Navy had not, by the summer of 1943, come to grips with the nature of the Japanese torpedoes. No one in authority in the South Pacific seemed to understand what the Japanese had, although since the beginning of the Tokyo Express runs down the slot, the Japanese had scored victory after victory by using these torpedoes. Admiral Ainsworth went into the Battle of Kolombangara, believing that the destroyer Strong, sunk only a few days earlier, had been the victim of a submerged submarine, not of a destroyer torpedo fired from a distance impossible for an American destroyer to duplicate. Some officers had heard rumours about the effectiveness of the Japanese torpedoes, but they were just that, rumours. Commanders did not make policy based on rumours, and there were no official directives nor any high-level understanding of the problem. This was true even though, Morrison reported, a long lance torpedo came ashore at Cape Esperance on Guadalcanal, was taken apart and examined, and the facts were sent on to Pacific Fleet Intelligence at Pearl Harbour. There the report was apparently bottled up, one of the vital bits of information of the day, and the war went on. The fact was that the Japanese at Kolumbangara had again outfought the Americans and defeated them in terms of damage done, but it was also a Pyrrhic victory. The loss of the cruiser Jinsu was a high price to pay for a Japanese navy that was already feeling the results of the long battle of attrition in the Solomons. From the Japanese army point of view, the Battle of Kolombangara had been a complete success. The Navy's protective force had done just what it set out to do, drawn the American attack away from the troop landing, and 1,300 badly needed reinforcements were on their way to New Georgia. But once again the Japanese army made a vital mistake. It brought too little power forward to do the job. 
For example, just then Admiral Turner was pressing Admiral Halsey for about 25,000 more troops to throw into the battle. The Japanese were thinking in terms of battalions, the Americans in terms of divisions. Later in the war, the troop shortage would plague the Japanese. Just at this time, that difficulty was not paramount. The Japanese could have sent the whole 6th Division to reinforce General Sasaki, and the idea was suggested at Rabul by junior staff officers. However, the commanders looked to New Guinea and worried about their two-front war. They made the mistake of ignoring the suggestion that strong manpower at this juncture would do wonders in the defence of New Georgia. In the air, Japanese and American planes fought nearly every day as the American Solomon's Air Force met the Japanese 11th Air Fleet. The Japanese sent flights of bombers and occasional single planes, and in the evenings the seaplanes from the Shortlands were out. Kula Gulf was the scene of activity on both sides night after night. The difference between the war at this stage and that of a few months earlier at Guadalcanal was that Kula Gulf, unlike Iron Bottom Sound, was a real no-man's land. Japanese and Americans moved in those waters constantly by night, and there were many minor encounters in which men died. Scores of planes were lost on both sides as the pilots bombed and strafed the waters of the Gulf. For example, on July 14, a whole flight of four P-39 Aero Cobras simply disappeared over southern New Georgia. Whether they fell afoul of a flight of zeros or ran into bad weather was a matter for intelligence to try to figure out. Those four pilots were just statistics in a war so hot that only the major actions have been chronicled. At Inogai, Colonel Liversedge was bogged down. He had taken this point, as directed, but he could not move until someone else did. The victory of the naval forces at Kolombangara did not seem like much of a victory, since all this while the enemy was continuing to infiltrate more troops, while his help still did not come up from the south. For the next three days, from July 13 to July 16, his men went out on patrol. Usually they encountered some of the enemy, and a few shots were exchanged. During the whole period, Liversedge lost one man killed and one man wounded. On both sides, the sparring was cautious. General Sasaki's troops were busy digging in for the assault against Bairoko that they expected. They were also preparing a counter-attack against General Hester's force between Liana and Zanana. The Japanese referred to this area as the Sho River, and this is where General Sasaki planned to attack. On July 13, the staff officer from Sasaki's headquarters handed Colonel Tomonari his orders. The 13th Infantry Regiment, with all speed, will move to the Sho River Upper Stream area, where the 169th Regiment was bogged down. You will disembark on the shore in the Suzumoko vicinity, west of Zanana, and make a flank attack on the enemy's main force to destroy the pressure on the shore. After this, immediately, you will move to the upper water of the Sho River in the Fujita Bridge area, and relieve the troops of the 229th Regiment there. You will secure the river crossing and then destroy the enemy's main force in the upper river region. You will be accompanied by a platoon of engineers to the Sho River crossing, and they will be responsible for your crossing. Then you will leave the Sugi Artillery Reserve Corps in command of the Fujita Bridge, and through the wireless squad as well as the telegraph squad, you will report on these actions to this headquarters. Following these orders, the 13th Infantry began to move out from the plantation area near Munda. On July 14, one company left at Tenam. This advance guard would move first to the Sho River Upper Stream crossing mentioned in the orders. They were to scout the enemy and report on the topography, and after that the attack plans would be made final. Except for wireless communication, from this point on the unit was to be out of touch with General Sasaki's headquarters. There was no way that Sasaki could be in touch with them because the distance was too great, but he was not dismayed. He had every confidence in Colonel Tomonari and the picked troops that made up the 13th Regiment. On July 14 and 15, headquarters had two sets of situation reports. The regiment reached the operational area and made contact with the enemy. Colonel Tomonari reported then that something strange was going on in the Rendover Bay area. A large force was being brought over to the Sho River, Zanana. What this meant, Colonel Tomonari was not quite sure but it seemed to him that the time had come to strike. That message was sent at 7.29 on the morning of July 14, 
and General Sasaki agreed. He sent off a message to Rabul with a duplicate addressed to Buan just in case the Rabul message was not picked up, and he gave details of his new plan for an offensive. He announced that the time had come for the offensive to stop the enemy's build-up and destroy the beachhead at Zanana and Liana. This was the psychological moment to attack, he said. It must be done within the next ten days, or the defence of New Georgia was in jeopardy, and for the second time the Japanese would suffer tragedy. He was obviously referring here to Guadalcanal and the error of sending too little too late that had cost the Japanese that island. What General Sasaki wanted was not just permission to attack, he already had that. What he wanted was massive air and naval support, plus more troops. The messages went off, but they were never acknowledged. Apparently neither one was picked up. So General Sasaki's new plan of attack was never revealed to Rabaul, and no support was to be forthcoming at the outset. Meanwhile, General Sasaki was having just about as much trouble with his local communications. After a few days' rest, the men of the 13th Regiment were pronounced ready to face fire again, and they moved out. Major Kikuda's 3rd Battalion set off on July 14 for the Zanana area, and they began crossing the mountains, up one hill and down the dale, the never-ending slogging along in dense jungle all the way. The Major soon found that the map he had was of no use, and they navigated by compass, heading east. Colonel Liversedge's men continued to organise the ground in the American Northern Forces area. Every night they were bombed by washing machine Charlie, which meant one or more of the Japanese float planes from the shortlands. Sometimes there were a few casualties, and for the most part the bombs knocked down palm trees. Colonel Liversedge waited, but the Japanese failed to make a pass at his roadblock along the Bairoko Munda Trail, and he did not realise that the enemy had begun using shortcuts. It was certainly true that the roadblock had been useful in preventing the Japanese from reinforcing the Inugai garrison when Liversedge was attacking it, but it had not cut off supplies to Munda, as he hoped. At the end of this time, the roadblock forces were withdrawn to Triri, and for a week planes had been supplying them by air, but most of the supplies went into the jungle and a lot of them were recovered by the Japanese. Since nothing much was happening, it seemed best to bring the men up to safety. On July 15, the wounded were moved to Inugai, whence they could more easily be evacuated to Guadalcanal. The roadblock was abandoned, and Colonel Liversedge waited for his reinforcement. It never came. Finally, Major General Oscar Griswold, the commander of the 14th Corps, announced to General Millard Harmon, Halsey's ground forces commander, that Hester would have to have another division of troops to move forward on New Georgia. The fact was that the assault had been bollocksed up more thoroughly than any manoeuvre in the South Pacific to that date. General Hester had split his regiments, one taking the upper trail and one staying along the coast. Finally, on July 13, the badly mauled 172nd Infantry did reach Liana. But then General Sasaki, who knew the terrain, moved a battalion of the Imperial Army's 13th Infantry in between the two American regiments. The 169th was cut off, deep in the jungle, and its supplies were exhausted. The troops were subsisting on airdrops, with many of the bundles falling into the hands of the enemy. When Admiral Halsey had the word that more troops were essential, he sent General Harmon up to New Georgia to find out exactly what was going on. When Harmon arrived, he was dismayed at the state of morale of the two regiments and the confusion of General Hester's command. Virtually on the spot, he relieved General Hester, and he told Griswold that in the absence of any other, the corps commander would also have to take over the assault force. The problem, as it would be again, was the inadequate training of the army troops assigned to the New Georgia operation. In the beginning of the South Pacific, Battle Admiral Turner had employed the Marines. They had been trained for this sort of warfare, particularly the raider battalions. Indeed, at San Diego, the Navy maintained an amphibious school, and out of this would come Major General Holland Smith to take over the Central Pacific invasions. The Army troops, General MacArthur's command, accepted had been trained for European-type operations. As the Navy claimed, its men had been given training on Guadalcanal, but that was minimal, and obviously it was not as well done as it should have been. The officers of the New Georgia Assault Force were not as expert and confident as they should have been. In their war history of the South Pacific, 
the Japanese make much of the powerful effect their noise and confusion tactics wreaked on the enemy at New Georgia. When General Griswold took tactical command at New Georgia, he saw that he needed fresh troops from Guadalcanal, and he estimated that it would take ten days to get the offensive going again. He began moving troops into the Zanana area as rapidly as possible, and this activity was the subject of Colonel Tominari's report of July 14. That day, the 3rd Battalion had its difficulties. Major Kikuda set out from the plantation area with his map, assuming that it would be an easy march, but he found no trail, and although he heard shooting, he saw nothing, and soon the battalion was lost. Kikuda tried to get oriented by using a compass, but even that was not very satisfactory. He and his men kept coming back to points they had already passed. They really did not know where they were until suddenly, quite by accident, through a clearing in the jungle the Major caught the sound of surf, and then they saw below them a dense mangrove swamp. The seacoast must be nearby, the battalion made a ninety-degree turn off its old course, and after an hour's walk the troops found themselves on a hill overlooking the seashore. Below them, not a hundred feet away, they could see half a dozen American troops. They must be near the American landing area, and they found Colonel Tominari and reported. As night approached, they assumed their defensive positions so that they would not be surprised on the evening before their attack by a night counterattack from the Americans. At five o'clock that evening, the battalion leaders went to the regimental command post to get their orders from Colonel Tominari for the next day's action. It was July 16, two more days after Colonel Tominari's request to stage the attack, before the permission came and the wheels were put in motion. During that time, although the colonel was moving his force into position, the Americans did not even know he was there. The 1st Battalion would kick off from its bivouac area, and the 3rd Battalion would deploy to the right to cover the flank of the main attack until it was launched, and then join. The time was set for six o'clock, just as the sun was setting, and the fortified positions of the 229th Regiment were all around them. The enemy knew there were Japanese troops up the hill, and as the evening came the artillery began to fire on the hills. At a signal, the men of the 13th Regiment began to move forward, crawling and creeping with their heads down. It was rough country, covered with century plants whose spikes stung their cheeks as they moved along. When the 1st Battalion had reached a point about a hundred feet from the American lines, they were discovered, and rifles and automatic weapons began to open up. Still, Colonel Tominari did not get up. Now the heavy cloud cover that had moved around the island all day long began to spill rain, heavy showers that drenched friend and foe alike. During one of these downpours, Colonel Tominari decided the psychological moment had come and gave the order. Attack! The first up was a platoon leader of the 2nd Battalion, Cadet Enseyazachi, and he charged forward until he was shot down. The Japanese lost men, but this attack was a success. The 13th Regiment had driven the Americans back, causing them to leave tanks, machine guns and scores of 155mm artillery pieces in their wake. Among other things, the Japanese captured a supply dump, which was more than welcome because they were cut off from their own supplies by the speed with which they had marched and the constant interdicting action of the American air forces, but now they were resupplied with food at least. That night the troops spent clearing out the old enemy battle camp and making it habitable for themselves. Act One in the drama of the 13th Infantry's mission had been successfully completed. The weather continued to be stormy, and the 13th Regiment was out of touch with General Sasaki's headquarters for several days. During this period, the American artillery and air forces did what General Hester's infantry had been unable to do. They kept the Japanese at bay. The constant bombardment and bombing by American planes was hard on morale. That first major attack had left the elements of the division badly scattered, and it was all Colonel Tominari could do to bring them together again under the heavy impact of the American fire but the Japanese held the positions. On the night of July 17, Colonel Tominari staged another attack against the American troops on the shore. By this time, the 43rd United States Army Division had arrived, and its command post was located not far from Zanana. Colonel Tominari ordered the new attack. It was carried out in the same manner as the first, 
and before the Americans knew it, the Japanese were inside the perimeter and inside the command post. Colonel Tomonari had advanced to within 400 yards of the sea. The regiment reported back to General Sasaki. It had scored a complete victory. The historians of the United States 43rd Division have challenged this contention, and they say little about the attacks of this period. But the fact is that from the 1st of July until nearly the end, the American land forces in southern New Georgia were badly in disarray and were neither advancing nor winning any battles. The 13th Regiment attacked again and again and won ground every time. Fresh troops from the Army 148th Regiment were brought to face them and open the Munda Trail. Only then could the weary troops of the 169th Regiment be rescued from the upper trail to Munda. They had been cut off for two weeks. The only way they were surviving against the Japanese, who attacked from all sides, was by clustering together and with the help of airdrops and air support. The most important factor in holding the Japanese down during this period was the heavy American artillery, operating from Onyavisi Island across the Roviana Lagoon, just three miles away. Had it not been for these big guns, the entire bridgehead would probably have been destroyed. The first evidence of General Griswold's contribution to the battle was the appearance of marine light tanks. Six of them came in to push upstream and relieve the 169th Infantry, but it did not take the tankers long to learn that this was not good tank country, and soon the six operating tanks were in action. They moved along rapidly from the beach at Laiana to the western outposts and up the hill, knocking out several Japanese coconut log bunkers. But then they began encountering the prepared positions of Colonel Hirada's men, which included sunken concrete pillboxes. In a fashion that would become more famous on the islands of the Central Pacific, the Japanese had built a complex system of connecting trenches, and they could move rapidly from one to another. At one place near Bairoko, they were reported to have dug a tunnel through the hill, six feet high, three feet wide, and three hundred feet long. From such formidable defences, the Japanese soon began knocking out the tanks, one by one. They had no anti-tank weapons, so they adapted landmines to the purpose, and they also used a flamethrower. Soon they had damaged three tanks, which were forced to withdraw. They were not replaced in this struggle. To keep the Japanese at bay during this uncomfortable new build-up period, General Griswold called on Guadalcanal for artillery, naval and air support, and he got it, but how much good it did above the harm is perhaps questionable. The harm was that in the dense jungle, the Japanese had no hesitation in coming to close quarters, and the bombs and shells were about as likely to fall among the Americans as among the enemy troops. Very early on July 18, Colonel Liversedge finally got reinforcement, but it did not come from the army troops down south. Despairing of that situation, Admiral Turner sent Liversedge the 4th Raider Battalion, under Lieutenant Colonel Curran, who had taken Segi Point and then Viru. The men of the 4th Raider Battalion came up in six destroyer transports, and these were escorted by five other destroyers. While on the way, just after midnight, the United States destroyer force received a report of three unknown destroyers dead in the water, not far off the Kolombangara coast. Obviously, these were Japanese destroyers, unloading more troops, the American destroyers moved in to attack, but the Japanese avoided them and made smoke. The attack fizzled out. The next excitement came just after two o'clock in the morning, when a violent explosion buckled plates and shook the destroyer Lang from end to end. She had been hit by a bomb that had come out of nowhere. Some men even thought at first it was a torpedo. Washing machine Charlie was at work again. The bombing had created enough damage in the engine room to force the Lang to slow down. The radar reported many enemy planes and this situation continued for two hours, although the Lang was not bombed again. She was able to complete the escort mission and then returned to Tulagi for repairs, and she had been in battle, but the results were muddy. Who and what had been out there in the air and on the sea were not known to captain or crew. This is the way it was night after night in Kula Gulf, as Americans and Japanese set out simultaneously to reinforce their positions, and yet prevent the enemy from doing the same. At one o'clock op the morning of July 18, after their wild ride, the fourth raiders arrived at Enagai Inlet, 
The reinforcement did not mean as much as it seemed, because Curran's unit arrived 200 men short. The destroyer transports that brought the Marines in also took all the wounded and sick men out, and when all heads were counted, Colonel Liversedge did not have many more men than he had begun with in the Rice Anchorage landing. Still, Liversedge was itching to get moving, and he called a conference of his battalion commanders, two Marine and two Army, and that afternoon made plans for an assault on Bairoko, the Japanese port of entry for reinforcements from Kolombangara. Tentatively, he scheduled the attack for July 20, and to soften up Bairoko he asked for and got air attack. The Japanese positions were bombed and strafed by aircraft from Guadalcanal on July 19, but for that matter so was Enogai, bombed twice on the evening of the 19th. In the first raid, nine men were hit, none was hit in the second raid. That day, Liversedge embroidered the plan, gave each battalion its instructions, and issued verbal orders that they could mull over while the written orders were prepared. They were to be ready to move out at 7.30am on July 20, and on July 20, Colonel Liversedge started his offensive against Bairoko. On the right hand, or north, were the troops of the 1st Raider Battalion and the 4th Raider Battalion. On the left was the 3rd Battalion of the Army, 148th Infantry. The 3rd Battalion of the Army, 145th Infantry, was left back at Enagai in reserve. Liversedge's drive ran up against the Japanese at about 10.15am. He found that the enemy had made good use of the time when the Americans had been held up waiting for reinforcement. The Japanese had built emplacements of coral and logs and had dug in behind them. The positions were constructed with an eye to cross fire and snipers had taken to the coconut palms above where they sat quietly, their camouflaged uniforms enhanced with bits of palm frond and dirt that broke the human silhouette. As the Americans came up, the Japanese opened up with machine guns and mortars, and the snipers began their work. Colonel Liversedge quickly discovered that he had moved into a hornet's nest. The Japanese defence was four tiers deep, with interconnecting trenches. The Americans approached with enormous firepower, and the din of automatic weapons was deafening. One observer, who had been at Bloody Ridge on Guadalcanal, swore that the volume of fire at Bairoko was more intensive. Liversedge's troops discovered the extent of the Japanese defences when they breached the first line, only to find that the second line was as strong. They broke through the second line at 2.30 that afternoon, after Liversedge had committed his local reserves, the 4th Raiders, and half the demolition platoon. The position looked good on high ground, within view of Bairoko Harbour, but there were two more lines of defence to be broken, and here Liversedge began to run into real trouble. At 3.47am, Liversedge asked for the last of the reserves. He was ready to make his final push. The Japanese seemed to be on the run, and many were seen without weapons, and he figured he could take the point in short order, and then control Bairoko Harbour. The move looked a lot easier than it turned out to be, and one reinforced platoon began to move up to the west along the narrow spit north of Leland Lagoon. They moved forward as far as the west end of the lagoon, but there they were stuck, held down by mortar and rifle grenade, knee mortar, fire. Actually, the knee mortar was not a rifle grenade, but a true small calibre mortar designed to be operated by a single infantryman. The long, narrow tube handled an ordinary Japanese grenade, and at 3.30am the Japanese began their counter-move, with something the Americans did not expect. It started with a heavy 90mm mortar barrage on all units, and especially the command post. The Americans began to take more casualties than Liversedge had expected. He could not reply in kind. He had no heavy mortars. By five o'clock the last of his reserves had been committed, and he was no further ahead than he had been an hour before. It was remarkable. The Japanese were pinned into a small defensive perimeter, not more than 300 yards from east to west and 600 yards from north to south. But those 90mm mortars were fired with speed and accuracy and without apparent regard for expenditure of ammunition. Shortly after 5pm, the American left flank reported that a Japanese counterattack seemed to be building up. Liversedge continued the firefight until 5.15pm and then decided he was getting nowhere. He moved the casualties out and gave orders to withdraw to the high ground 500 yards east of the harbour. 
Half an hour later, the withdrawal was underway, with the Americans losing some ammunition, but saving all weapons and all their wounded. The walking wounded, 80 of them, began the long, long trek back to Enogai, a mile away. Two companies of the 4th Raiders covered the withdrawal and stayed up on the high ground until 6pm when they were ordered back to Enogai. They returned, reporting that just before they left, two barges loaded with Japanese reinforcements entered by Rocco Harbour. They were just the first of the small boats to come in. The Japanese stream of reinforcements had not even been slowed down. As night fell, Colonel Liversedge had a report from Lieutenant Colonels McCaffrey and Schultz, who had been sent off that same day with a column to move around to Triri and then down to Bairocco to flank the Japanese and support Liversedge. They had run into a strong Japanese force three miles outside Triri and had been pinned down. Liversedge ordered them to dig in for the night. He then counted noses. He had lost 49 men killed, 206 wounded and one man missing. The 4th Raiders had taken the worst beating, with 205 casualties. They had reported 33 dead Japanese, but that was all they knew about the defenders' casualties. The attack had been anything but a success. There was no way Liversedge could attain his objective without substantial reinforcement. On July 21, the wounded were evacuated by three PBYs from Guadalcanal. After Liversedge reported on his troubles, a massive airstrike was brought in to hit Bairoko. From 10 o'clock in the morning until dusk, American fighters came in every hour to strafe and SBD dive bombers to bomb the Japanese positions there. The Japanese retaliated in kind. At 4.30 that afternoon, a strong force of Zeros hit Inagai Inlet and the Marine positions and damaged one PBY, and that night, Washington Machine Charlie was back again. The battle for Bairoko seemed to have reached a stalemate, the American troops in southern New Georgia were in disarray, and two men knew it very well. One was General Griswold, who was fighting time to bring in the new force that could move up to help Colonel Liversedge take Munda. The other was General Sasaki, whose pleas to Rabul for an immediate major effort in the air and on the sea were going unanswered. The United States 169th Regiment was dawdling on the Munda Trail, cut off from the beachhead by the Japanese and virtually encircled. One battalion actually was encircled, and with that the regiment's snail-like pace up the Munda Trail came to a halt. The Japanese ambushed the trail parties that tried to take casualties back to the Zanana beachhead. They whooped and hollered all night long like savages, and cut the throats of the soldiers in their foxholes on the perimeter. Day after day, more Japanese troops infiltrated through the PT boat-infested waters of Kula Gulf to Bairoko, and then trudged their weary way overland to the plantation encampment north of Munda, where General Sasaki's officers parcelled them out to the areas where they were needed most. A growing problem for the Japanese would be the lack of artillery replacement. Their system of resupply did not allow for much movement of heavy equipment, so they continued to be without anti-tank guns and howitzers for the troops of the line. But they had plenty of light and heavy machine guns, grenades and heavy mortars, at whose use they were expert. And at least for the moment in southern New Georgia, the Japanese had the initiative. What kept the southern situation from becoming a rout of the Americans was air support. Both sides were throwing as many planes as possible into the air to hit enemy land positions, but the Americans had more planes. In the air, dogfights were not as common as they had been during the old Guadalcanal days, when the American fighters went up to shoot at anything they saw. Now their major mission was to escort the bombers to the target and protect them from the Zeros. The Japanese were doing the same, except that they sent many more fighters in attempts to lure the P-38s and F-4Us into combat. Their usual ploy was to lurk over Kula Gulf, simulating dogfights among themselves in the hopes that they would thus seduce United States fighter pilots into the web. It did not work very often, as the fighter pilots began to obey Admiral Mitch's stern orders to stick to the business at hand, which was to blast the daylights out of the Japanese troops on New Georgia. One of the most exasperating efforts of the Japanese was washing machine Charlie. The troops half-joked about the tinny sound of the float planes that harried them night after night, dropping a bomb here and there, but killing and wounding enough men to keep the joke from being funny 
These night raids cost the troops sleep by night and cut their efficiency by day. The only weapon effective against them was the night fighter, but there were not enough of these to make the patrols up and down Kula Gulf and the slot and intercept the lone bombers. However, the night fighter situation was growing better for the Americans. The Navy had its Black Cats PBYs equipped with radar for night operations, and the Army had P-70s, which were A-20 attack bombers, fitted with a radar set in the nose and four 20mm cannons. These ranged above New Georgia in the night time and shot down some of the washing machine Charlies. They were much more effective against the twin-engine Betty bombers the Japanese sent down on some nights. The American airstrikes against Japanese positions and shipping were sometimes effective, sometimes not. On July 17, Admiral Mitcher had word of a large concentration of shipping at Bougainville's Tonolay Harbour, and he sent up a giant airstrike reminiscent of the Japanese strikes against Guadalcanal six months earlier. Up went 220 planes, including four-engine B-24 Liberator bombers, dive bombers and torpedo bombers, covered by 114 fighters. This time the situation was reversed. The American fighters protected the bombers while the Japanese Zeros tried to get at them, and then the bombers ducked under the fighting and tried to do their work. Their success was not enormous. They sank the destroyer Hatsuyuki, but not much else. But two nights later, the American air forces did claim prey in a big way. The Japanese had sent another of their resupply missions toward Kolombangara that afternoon, and late at night a black cat discovered the convoy, which consisted of three heavy cruisers, one light cruiser and nine destroyers, under Rear Admiral Shoji Nishimura. The convoy was so large because the Japanese had been frustrated in their last attempt to resupply the troops fighting on New Georgia, and they wanted to make sure that this one did not fail. The three supply and troop-carrying destroyers headed in for Kolombangara's shore, and were chased and bombed by the night fighter, but without effect. But half a dozen bombers from Henderson Field attacked the cruiser destroyer force and dropped 2,000-pound bombs from low level. They sank the destroyer Yugur with one direct hit and damaged the cruiser Kumano, sure that his supply mission had been successful. Admiral Nishimura headed back home, leaving the destroyer Kiyonami to rescue survivors of the sunk destroyer. But the next morning, two flights of B-25 bombers skip-bombed the Kiyonami and left it sinking. On July 22, the Japanese sent a routine reinforcement mission to the Shortlands. It included three destroyers laden with troops and supplies, and the seaplane carrier Nishin, which was carrying an artillery battalion and its equipment. American bombers caught the convoy in broad daylight in Bougainville Strait and sank the Nishin with all that heavy equipment. The three destroyers made it safely to Buin, and the troops were moved down to the shortlands by barge. There was nothing wrong with the Japanese method of resupply and reinforcement of the troops in the central Solomons, except that it was far too costly in terms of destroyers and other valuable ships. The ineffectual attack launched by Colonel Liversedge's northern landing force had left him short of supplies. But on the night of July 23, Admiral Turner sent up a large convoy, two cruisers and five destroyers protecting four supply destroyers. They sneaked into Inagai Roads and managed to unload their supplies and take on the wounded without any more of an incident than the harassment of the landing by Japanese shore batteries on Kolombangara. Colonel Liversedge wanted more troops, but General Griswold was too badly bogged down in the south to give them to him. The fact was that both Americans and Japanese were operating on shoestrings, the American naval situation had improved marvellously since the Guadalcanal days because the European war, which was paramount in the plans of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, did not call for an American naval build-up. But the shortage of Allied troops was serious because the European theatre of operations devoured divisions as a dragon devours maidens. The Allied combined Chiefs of Staff were looking forward to the Normandy landings of the following year, and this meant bringing a million Americans and all their trucks and tanks and heavy artillery over to England. There was precious little left for the Pacific commands, and the Japanese too were facing shortage, at this point mostly of ships and planes, but later of troops as well. Their population base was less than half that of the United States. True, they had more men under arms at the beginning of the war,
but most of them were tied down in China and Manchuria, and they continued to be. Just now, faced with the problem of reinforcing the South Pacific, they were drawing on China, where over a million troops were operating, and the Kwantung Army of Manchuria, which numbered about 700,000 that year. Some units, particularly aviation, were moved in from China, but the Imperial General Staff was not inclined to strip these areas, which it considered to be far more important to bring reinforcements to the South. For these reasons, the South Pacific campaign continued to be a limited war. Just how limited is indicated by two encounters between Admiral Halsey and Captain Arleigh Burke, commander of a United States destroyer squadron. When Burke had come to the South Pacific, he had reported in to Admiral Halsey, as did all senior officers, in the office at the old Japanese consulate in Noumea. Halsey had fixed him with those blue gimlet eyes of his and given the captain a brief indoctrination. He did not care much about spit and polish discipline. What he wanted was fighting men and fighting ships, he had told Burke, and he did not want anything else. Burke had gone into action. He had led those four supply destroyers into Inagai on the night of July 23. So far from a real dockyard, his ships had quickly become troublesome, and the engineering gang had their work cut out for them to keep the vessels going at high speed. One of the destroyers in particular needed work, and equally, the destroyer chores of the Solomons' campaign needed every ship, and the men of the destroyers needed a break from the constant tension, but Halsey was hell on anyone who came up crying. So the situation continued until one day Burke, in desperation, simply sent his raunchiest destroyer down to Sydney without saying anything to anyone at Noumea. Halsey's antennae were always out, and scarcely had the ship returned to base when Captain Burke was called on the carpet, and he came in great trepidation to Noumea.